Anna Maria Cabanales began her career as a lawyer after studying at the University of Buenos Aires. After several years practicing, she joined the family-owned publishing firm Edicional Eliastra. As a partner in 1979, she became president of Editorial Claridad, which specializes in legal dictionaries, as well as fiction, philosophy, and history. In 2006, she founded Una Luna, which specializes in children's books. Active in industry associations, she speaks frequently at publishing congresses and has been named one of the 50 most influential people in publishing in the Spanish language. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. So we're here in your lovely offices. Uh, what neighborhood is this in Buenos Aires? Belgrano. And what is this neighborhood known for? Anything? No, it's residential, mostly residential. And it has beautiful shops, according to the people, where they can buy uh, clothes and have dinner and things like that. Okay. But it's mostly residential, not offices. Okay. Was it your father, Guillermo? Guillermo, yes. He uh, founded your company, Eliester, in 1944, is that right, or is it earlier than that? No, in 1944 he came to Argentina and he started writing uh, books, publishing books, but not with Eliasta, with another company that was called Atalaya. But then he had too much work as a lawyer, so he couldn't take care of the editorial, so he decided to work only as a lawyer, but he continued writing, and he published uh, with other companies, with Santillana, Lerner, Omega, Ediciones. And then, when I was finishing uh, my studies as a lawyer, it's when we decided to create this company, uh, my brother, my father, and me. My brother is still my partner, but he works, he writes, and he works principally in the law firm. He has a, a big law firm. So the law and publishing are pretty important in your, in well, your because family. We are all lawyers, my, right. do, my father, my brother, my daughter, and me. And so what kind of law do you, do you each specialize in a different kind of law? Or? Yeah, my father specializes in labor law and my brother in patents and marks, that's in, uh, intellectual property. property yeah. He is also, uh, well, a business lawyer and he works for banks and international companies and things like that. And he writes about those things, business economical law. And do, so do you publish his writing? I publish him, uh, but um, my, my father had a, a big love for dictionaries. So yeah. he wrote several uh, legal dictionaries, and my brother also wrote um, English-Spanish dictionary mm. and some other English-Spanish dictionaries. For not only law, but also for banks and things like that. Your father must have been a fan of Samuel Johnson then. My brother, more than my father. <laughs> yes. Oh, we studied Samuel Johnson in the university. At, when I started the university, that was one of the books we have to study. It's uh, His dictionary? N or no, his life? Y yes, dictionary and life was one part of our, of the books, the, our bibliography. Yeah, he's wonderful. And, that, and Boswell's life is a joy to read. Yes, really. Yeah. On the Claridad website. It states that books are a vehicle of peace, culture, education, and entertainment. Yes, I believe in that. Let's go through each one. So how is it a vehicle for peace? We have um, books that teach you how to comply with the other and be patient and all those things. And I think that my daughter went to a something that was called CISB, Children's International Summer Villages. And the idea there was to have children from different nationalities that at the age of 11, which is called like the magic age, 
they would become friends and that will avoid the war. So they would stay friends yes, over the years? Uh, yes. So yeah. I think that if you know each other, you are avoiding many things. And through the books, you can teach what happens in this country, what's the history, and learn more about what the people are. And that, in my idea, it's my idea, that may be good to avoid wars. I don't like wars. I'm the product of a war because my parents left Spain during the civil war on the first months. Uh -huh. And they start running and they were in several places before coming to Argentina. The good thing is that because of that I'm nine years younger. But the bad thing is that it was not good for, for them or for the family or mm -hmm. anything. So what specifically does your publishing house do to promote peace then? Well, we try to publish books that teach what other countries do. We publish books about North America and we publish books about Europe, uh, history books, most of it. And, well, I think that helps. Maybe not, but I do think it helps. You know, I'm press, I've been since 2004 to 2008. I was president of the International Publishers Association and that put me in contact with the publishing industries of all the world. Um, it doesn't show too much in my company, but I remember that when I accepted uh, being president, I thought that I could work a lot for the books and I think that the books transmit a lot to people and they help a lot for education. I'm a teacher before being a lawyer. I'm mm. a teacher. I never worked as a teacher only for a very short time. But I appreciate the book as a mean of teaching. Through the book you teach everything you want to teach. So uh, when you, you say that you publish books about other countries, do you actually sort of get the rights to yes. other books yes. for Argentina yes, and the, then publish them under your... Yes, uh, yes usually yeah. uh, we buy rights from other companies mm -hmm. and then we translate into Spanish and then we sell them not only in Argentina, we sell in all Latin America, mm -hmm. which I think it's also very important because the book it's not, it doesn't stay here. I've been tr uh, fighting a lot for the free circulation of books in Latin America, mm -hmm. because even if the books don't have taxes, in some countries they have taxes when the books get in, they have a lot, it's very expensive because the customs charge you, because you have to prepay the, the, some taxes, because in some countries like Chile they have VAT and they have to pay 19% of the amount of what you are sending. Mm. There was also VAT in Bolivia, we were happy when it disappeared, there is VAT in Guatemala, 15%. So these are all things that stop the free circulation of books. And for me, as the free circulation of books is very important. And I always thought that when the Kindle appeared or the other, other readers appear, that this problem will be solved. But there is a problem that cannot be solved, that is the economic situation of the, of the countries, mm. especially of the towns, because in the cities you may find many books, but when you go some kilometers inside uh, Honduras, for example, or, uh, yes, Honduras, for example, and you go and I needed once to do a photocopy and beside me they were photocopying a book which makes me crazy. Mm -hmm. But when I saw the book they were photocopying I wanted to cry because it was a book of, for medicine, to study medicine and the book was from the year 1940. It was completely destroyed and tell me from 1940, when I'm telling you this it was like 2004-2003 to 2003, so many years, many changes have occurred in, uh, happened in the medicine area, and they were still reading books from 1940. Mm. So that's what I'm always eager to get the books to other places, to other uh, people mm -hmm. that really need from the books, whatever book it is, mine or others. It's not something my books will solve no. the, the problems of the world, but the, the books in general will help to solve 
a lot of problems. But don't uh, countries sort of put up tariffs on books, for example, to protect the local publishing sector so that they can thrive? I mean, uh, usually that doesn't happen, but it happened here during the Kirchner government. You had to pay for everything you had to pay when you imported. You, you have to ask permission to import, and sometimes they wouldn't give you the permission, and that took lots of months, so it was a, a, a stop to the importation of books. Also, you had to pay, and we still pay now because it has it has come up again. You have to pay to the government nearly ten percent of what you export before you export. Before you get paid. Yeah, before the books leave the country, you have to pay. So that it's not uh, good for the industry. So why are they doing this? Because they need money. So as. When they changed the value of the dollar, they said, well, no, people, not books, everything. People now are going to export much more, so it's like, a, yeah. you get the price, but you give me the price, yeah. like price with set, yeah. and you give me part of that price. If you're going to benefit from a lower That's dollar, it. then we want to benefit too. That's it. That's okay. it. So. so is that, what's the situation now then? So now we pay every time we export. Yeah. We pay it's three pesos out of a dollar. Uh, three pesos of out, out of a dollar. Now one dollar is 40 pesos. Yeah. But when it was 30 pesos, it was 10%. Okay, so you, you would support getting rid of all of those tariffs then? Naturally, I would. I yeah. think and that would be help for. a lot. Yeah. For everything, it would help the industry because nowadays our industry here in Argentina needs a lot of exportation. Mm. All the industry, not only the book industry. Yeah. We need to export because uh, with the sales here in the country alone, we cannot go on. No. And what about the Spanish books that uh, are coming in here? What's the story on that? Do they get? Uh, they have to pay. No, no. When you import, you don't pay. You. But do they? Do they get to the Spanish book? publishers get to sell directly to Argentinian bookstores or not? Uh, it depends. Either they have their own distribution. They are, they are different situations. One is Spanish publishers that have their own publishing house in Argentina, like Planeta, Random House, etc. The big ones? The big ones, or sometimes not so big. EDAF, for example, has a house here in Argentina. Just so long as they've got a presence here in Argentina? That gives them a break on having to pay anything? Or? No, nobody pay. When you import, you yeah. don't pay taxes. Okay. You don't pay taxes. You pay when you export. The taxes you pay when you import, it's part, for example, if you import $100,000, they say, well, you're going to earn money over this $100,000. So you, play, you pay an advance, advancement of what you are going to pay as a tax on what you earn. Impuesto mm. a las ganancias. Mm -hmm. And that, when you present your taxes, you have that part already paid. Yeah. So okay. it's like an advancement. Mm -hmm. But it's not something you lose or anything, because in the same year you can apply it to your taxes. So that's not so bad. Okay. But in the end, when you import, you have to pay a lot of money because you have to pay the customs for the time the book is there, the books are there. Mm -hmm. You have to pay the transport inside and outside and all that. You have to pay insurances. You have to pay the the man that works for you for the and and brings the the books in. Mm -hmm. So all in and this tax. So all in all, it's a lot of money, and especially if you import only one book. So if you import like 10 books, this gets, it, it's smaller the, the weight it has in each book. Yeah. But if you import one book, it's very expensive because I imported, uh, I'm importing now one book because things that happen. And I'm paying for the book to the printer and the, the rights and everything, $7,000. And I'm going to pay $3,000 to bring the book inside. So let, let me get this clear. Then you uh, you have bought the rights to Argentina, or you're actually I, I, bought, I bought you're the actually rights and I made a co-edition. Okay, so China. you're not actually importing physical books. I'm importing physical books that are printed where in China. 
Okay. So the book is is printed in China, and when I'm uh, what I say seven thousand is the the rights plus the printing. But then I have to pay three thousand for sending the book for the transportation plus the insurance plus it's a lot. But obviously it's. Uh, economical for you to have it printed in China versus here. Um, yes, but in this case, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's it's not. I, yeah. I, if I would have done it here, it would have been okay. But this uh, company only gives you the books if you do a co-edition. So oh, I see. Okay. I couldn't have a duo otherwise. Okay. You see. Mm-hmm. So you're not happy with the government policy as it. Uh, I think that the government should n- not subsidize, like giving money just like that, but they could help in another ways to the local industry. For example, by buying more books. Yeah. As for they, schools, for as example. As they were buying before, by buying books for the libraries. For example, you have in the Scandinavian countries that when you launch a book, a new book, they buy it for the library. And if the library isn't, doesn't agree, they can give it back. But for example, if there is a law book and they have, uh, I don't know, X number of libraries, they buy 300 copies of your book. Yeah. And that's a, a big help for the publishers to do to print new books or to do mm-hmm. more, more books or more quant- a bigger quantity, yeah. which means that then the price of the book would be low, lower. Plus it takes some of the risk away from the... Yes. Print, the, the when publisher. I started, when I started here in 1970, 1971, I was printing 10,000 copies of each of my books. Naturally, because I was exporting, not only for Argentina, because I was exporting. Because in Argentina we would sell with some... We didn't sold in the li- in the bookshops, but we have some people that were going house by house selling. And also, if they came to my office, they could buy the books. But uh, not in the normal uh, bookstores for lawyers. There we, we weren't selling. But we would uh, do 10,000 books. Now I'm doing 300. And I export. <laughs> So with 300, it's, there is no incentive for the authors to write. That's the problem. They get more money from the Collective Management Association than the rights I pay. Here there is a Collective Management Association. Mm-hmm. I'm the vice president. It's called CADRA. And they get more money from the photocopies and the digital copies than the money I give them from the copies I sell. Uh, being in uh, in Buenos Aires, I, I keep hearing about the fact that there's more bookstores per capita in Buenos Aires than any other city in the world, and that the books are particularly important to the Argentinian people. You've also got more psychiatrists per capita, apparently, than anyone else in the world. So there's probably a connection between what <laughs> self knowledge or reflecting on, I don't know what it is, but but is that still hold? Is it, 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 yes, it still holds, although in the last months there have been some uh, bookstores that have been closed. They are usually very tiny here and in, uh, also in the inside the country they've been closing some bookstores. Mm. But we still have lots of bookstores. Yeah. Naturally, the relation, the economical relation, it's not the best. Because we don't sell the books, we give the books, in a, we consignate the books, they, and then they pay us, they sell. So, yeah, and then they get to return the stuff that doesn't yes, sell. Yes, they can return whatever they want, and then they can declare whatever they want. Usually, mm. as here, the prices go up every three months nowadays. Yeah. So every three months, you get uh, more sales than the other two months because they don't want to pay with the new price, so they declare what they have sold. But yes, it's difficult, it's very difficult to to work here. And the books are, they have a very high price. They do, I noticed that, yeah. But nonetheless, for example, for the children's books, uh, it's much cheaper to buy a book for a birthday than to buy anything to wear. 
No, a t-shirt, it's more expensive than a book. So people are going back to the books as a present, mm -hmm. which before wasn't the case. Right. I remember my daughter saying, don't be ridiculous. You cannot give a, a book as a present. That's not a present. <laughs> That's right. That's work. <laughs> <laughs> What is considered a bestseller? What's the number? Oh, well, in a Argentina? bestseller in Argentina. 5,000, it's more than a big bestseller. That's funny, because that's, that's 5,000 in Canada, it's the same thing. Yes? That's considered a bestseller, oh. it's 5,000. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so let's... Yeah, uh, you live in Canada? I live in Montreal. Oh, you know, I opened the, the library. The, the uh, yeah, Bibliothèque Nationale? I did, I did a, a congress in Montreal. In 2004 or 2005, I don't, I really don't remember, but I, uh, it must be 2005. Well, I just had become president of IPA, and I found that there we were doing a, a congress in Montreal. That was wonderful. I went in January to visit the place where the, this would take place. The snow, it was, yeah, oh, yeah. it was gorgeous. And then uh, the, uh, this congress took place in June or something like that. And there was this library, and we went for the opening, and I cut the... Did you? Yeah, it was interesting, yes. Huh. I was president of IPA at that time. I'm trying to think, because I interviewed the, uh, the, the head of the, the library. Yeah, at that time, it was a Lise, lady. Lise Bizonette. Yes, probably. very nice lady. She's very dynamic, yeah. Very nice, and the library is beautiful. Yes. Uh, okay, so let's get back to our yeah, to, uh, <laughs> books as a vehicle of peace. Okay, so we've covered that. What about culture? Culture comes with books. You okay. learn through books. Okay. Yeah. I know, I know I it's obvious. Know, I don't know books for, for schools. You don't publish Start books? With, no, no, I don't publish textbooks. I no. publish books. Okay. But I think culture goes... And you learn. You give. You take the culture from the books. That's so where you get your understanding of culture. Everything. Right? I, I don't know. I'm. I'm permanently reading now. Now I'm happy that I have the Kindle, and I can ah. go everywhere with my Kindle. And I have a library with me. You don't read on the Kindle. I hate. The, I hate reading on a screen. Yeah. Oh well. But that's just me being an old uh, fart. Well, but I travel like six months a year. I see. And so you can't carry uh, yes. your library with you. Yes. Yeah. Well, now you can. The only books I carry is my brother that keeps buying books and I keep bringing them. <laughs> <laughs> He sounds like a man. Uh, only four at a time. Good taste. I, 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 <laughs> if my husband comes with me, then he can get eight. But if not, only four. <laughs> okay. So you say that you enjoy what you do. So why do you enjoy what you do? Well, I think like I'm like a bridge between people that write and have something to say and people that want to know what other people say. And in the case of the children, I think that the children books are something marvelous. I'm they, going to take a photograph of those they, covers. They're great. Yes, they yeah. make children happy. Yeah. I started, when I started this, this part of the company, I would go to my grandchildren and I will show them the drawings, I will tell them the tales. Mm. Or if I was here in Buenos Aires, I would go to another daughter's house and I would, I remember sitting on the stairs and started reading, a, translating, not a translation because it was the book in English mm. that I had. And I would translate it to the children and then I would come here and I said, oh look this, we will not buy it. They didn't pay attention, they <laughs> went. <laughs> you used them as a focus group. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. it was very interesting. And now we have another company, it's called Tobogan. Yeah. And with Tobogan we do books for activities. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, because mm. I, I, when the book fair comes, which will be next month, mm. uh, no, on the 23rd of April. This month, yeah. Yes, I'm, I go to, the, to my booth, to my stand, every day, and either I'm behind... Uh, I'm putting the books in, in, the, in the bag just to talk with the people. Or I go and I sit, we have a small table with the, like, a, like a moon, and I sit with the children there and I, see, I read to them mm. or I see what they like. And it's a wonderful uh, way to get, have an idea yeah. of what people want or what, why they don't want your books or what. 
And then you see the girl that says, Oh, daddy, daddy, look, this is to learn how to multiply. This is a wonderful book I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. So, yes, we are having a very good um, experience with these kind of books. In, in fact, we bought them from... There was a company here called Remolino, and they closed. So we, what we did is buying the rights of Remolino, and with them we do new books and reprint the old books. But it's a very good experience. So you, what you enjoy most... I is dealing I, with the kids. I, 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 yes, the kids are much better than the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy what I do. The only the part that I don't enjoy is numbers. I don't enjoy that they don't pay. I don't enjoy that. Yeah, you have to keep. Uh, I, uh, yes, really, yeah. the situation now is again horrible, and that I don't enjoy. When horrible, just horrible, getting getting paid. Getting paid, yes, yes, it's very difficult to get paid. Yeah. It's very difficult to sell. Everything is difficult. That's why exporting it's so exporting books it's so important uh, because like that. Do you get paid quicker and better by? You get foreign? paid better, or for example, in Spain, I have my own distribution, so that allows me to do more books. For example, if I would be printing only for Argentina, I would be printing two thousand copies. Yeah, yeah. And now I print four thousand copies, which brings the Cost price down much for, lower. For everyone, yeah. Yes. But I have to recover the money to invest again. So what do you mean you've got if your the own... Chain, if, the, if the chain breaks, then it's difficult to do more books. Yeah. I, have my, I have a company in Spain. So when I print the books in China, part of the books go directly to Spain. And there, with, a, with someone else, they distribute them and they sell them. But so I import the books. So if I want to import 900 or 1,000... Or 3,000, it's my problem because nobody has to pay. They only have to distribute my books. So what, you've got like a warehouse operation kind of thing? Yes, with someone else, with another uh, publishing company. Oh, okay. okay. It, it's a publishing company, it's called Edaf, and they used to do children books. We were following, uh, for example, sometimes I bought the rights for Latin America and they bought the same book for Spain. And one day they decided they didn't want it to do more children books. So we associated. Okay. So it's good. Yeah. But uh, the risk, the economical risk, is mine. They only do the distribution. Do you find that children's books are uh, more profitable, the most profitable, or not? It's what I sell most. Yes. Why is that? Well, it, there is now like a, it's in to yeah. to make the children's read because it it depends on the times. It's always been in, though. It's always been in, but the books are much nicer. So I think the the children and the parents are more tempted to buy. You mean they're they're better designed? They are better designed. The stories are we adapt the stories for the age. Uh, yes, they have more drawings, more colors. Mm. Some of our books have instructions for the parents at the back for other activities they can do from the book. We've done some classical books, for example, Poe, Julio Verne, uh, Julius Verne, and um, Dracula, for example, all those books. We do them in a format that it's like a transition between the books with drawings and the yeah. books without drawings. Okay. So they still have drawings, black yeah. and white, and uh, they, they have a, a big letter, not too, too tiny, so it's a transition, and those books, the parents like, and the teachers, they like them very much. Mm -hmm. So we are having a, a very good um, mm. reception of those kind of books. Yeah, I think it's always good to, to read the classics to your kids, and if you can do it in a yes, way that's fun. Yes, yes. Yeah. The thing is sometimes for, there are many editions of the classics, so you have to be different. And usually the way to be different is with graphics and design? Graphics, design, and also we have formats. We have some books that you read them without words, and you can read them without words because the last page you can open it, and in that page there is the story, and then also the teacher can turn the page around and show only the drawings and she has the text. So that book, for example, they, they like it very much. The children mm. and the parents, they like it very much. Sounds like what you're doing is catering to kids that are very young 
and then they get a bit older and you've got something different for yes, them. Yes, I don't go to young adults. No, you no. Go, you, that's where you stop. Yes, yes. Yeah. Although I have one, a grandchild that's always recommending me books for young adults. Hmm. He's 16 now, okay. but he's been recommending me books since he was 10. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what business he's going to get into. Uh, systems. Oh, okay. He's in the. He goes to Berkeley to study uh, um, computers. Code, code. Code. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's a, a little genius. Is he? Yes. She gets that from his grandmother. No, <laughs> no, no, no. That comes from his father. Okay. That's not my son. <laughs> okay. Here's the kind of a mission statement for Una Luna. Art and stories that stimulate mental and emotional development, inspire independence of spirit, and enthusiasm for learning, and tolerance for diversity, and that also develop social skills. Well, because our books, as I told you, they have, we try to do books that have extra activities, and also, uh, for example, we've now done a. Red Riding Hood, Hansel and Gretel, and Rapunzel, with the story is changed. So it's completely changed. It's, uh, Red Riding Hood is the one that bites the wolf. <laughs> and so it's not a helpless little victim. No, no, she's, she's a not. Woman. She's, she's a girl who's stronger, strong. Yeah. Stronger. Well, sometimes we do the normal ones, but we try not to do the normal ones. You know. <laughs> okay. And for example, we have one that's the um, the frog from the other from another place, and that one, for example, it's very well sold because it's uh, about tolerance, about uh, someone that's different being accepted by the others, and it's a very nice story. Yes, I am. I, I really love that book, and we, I never thought we would be selling it so much. The, the, the nicest thing that happened to me with that book is that the, the government in Argentina asked us to do a version in Braille. In Braille? Oh, yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. for the blind children, mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. the schools. Yeah. And they, they really love it. They really love it because naturally they are different and in the book they don't feel different. Mm -hmm. And we have to ask the authors to change because some of the pages, the story was just told by the illustration. So the book is illustrated, it has the letters, but it's written in Braille too. Mm. And the, the, the writing, it's, it's huge for the children that have difficulty. Well, no wonder you're, you enjoy what you're doing. It's like you're making a difference, you're helping to shape future good citizens. We try, we try our best. I mean, that's obviously one of the things that you must feel good about. Yes. You know, when you, you realize you're doing something well, when governments buy your book. And, for example, in Chile, we have wonderful sales to the government because they, our books are very are much required there. It's one of the countries that still buy books, no? Uh, also, Chile. Yes, mm. Chile. Now for what? For the schools for or the just schools? directly? No, for schools. the schools. Yeah. They buy yeah. like 3,000, 5,000, and sometimes they rebuy the book they already bought. Also in El Salvador, the government is buying our books a lot. In Guatemala, in Mexico. Well, in Mexico, you have to do a different edition for Mexico. But when they buy, they buy 50,000 copies. Okay. Um, the album books, instead of doing it hardcover, hard they do it soft cover, and the size, the size has to be smaller, but the book has to be exactly the same book you are selling. Naturally, the price, what they pay is, uh, is the rights, a mm. little bit more than the rights. So then you divide that with your author, and you don't earn much money. But to know that some books have gone to 50,000 children, it's really, it makes you proud. Yeah. Because usually they try to buy the Mexican books, no? So when they buy a book from Argentina, it's something that makes you proud. Uh, why else do you enjoy uh, publishing? I don't know. I've been in publishing since I was a girl. Because, um, because your father was... Doing as it. my father was writing, I was helping. Uh, so part of the game with my father meant helping him. If you were getting in the same business or work that he was doing 
it meant that you got to spend time with him. Oh yes, I spent a lot of time with my father, yeah. And we have the office together. Yes, yes. Yes, until his last day, I spent time with him. Then he, he got sick, but only for three days. So the last day he went to work, we had lunch together. No, we were very friendly with my father. I was also very friendly with my mother, which is good. I yeah. hope my children are also friendly with me. <laughs> one of them works here, but for himself. And uh, the other one is in the United States. And then I have two stepchildren. And uh, my, my husband was a widow, so uh, we are a very close family. The, the four children are very close between them and the grandchildren too. So it's good. I, have, I love to have a, a big family. And you're very lucky. Yes, I am. <laughs> and to be healthy, to enjoy them. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the situation with uh, fair dealing here in... Uh, what do you mean by fair dealing? I mean, uh, uh, is there sort of a percentage of a work that an educational institution is allowed to photocopy? Without ah, paying, yes, yes, yes. I tell uh, you. without uh, paying anything, they have to do an agreement. They have to get a license. The university, the university, the University of Buenos Aires has a license. So we have a collective licensing association for the books. It's called Cadra, and they have the University of Buenos Aires, for example, has two licenses. One license is for an analogic for books and they can copy 20% of the book. But they, how does it work? Do they, does each student have to pay a, no, a fee? No, the university pays a fee for each student. And that's to the collective? Yes. Okay, and then they can, then they can photocopy up to 20%. 20% of the book or a whole chapter. Okay, I see. The same thing happens with the digital. They can upload a whole chapter or part of the book. For okay. example, in a book written by my father, 20% will be more than one chapter. But in the short books, maybe the chapter is more than 20% of the book, in those books that are 100 pages. So are you happy with that uh, arrangement? That's what we have. We would like to have private copy, as they have, for example, in Spain. And then... What's that? Private copy means that the telephone, the computer, the iPad, the photocopying machine, they have to pay a canon, they have to pay uh, an amount for the copies that the people will be doing with this, with the, the iPad or whatever, at home. When Who's, who has to pay that? The, the manufacturer or the importer when they are imported. That means and a that lot of money that goes to the publishers okay. and to the authors, 50% each. But uh, here we don't have private copy, so, but we uh, also license the photocopying shops. So the photocopying shop is allowed to do 20% of a book. So if someone, a non-student, me, I go with a book, I can photocopy 20% of the book in a photocopying shop that's allowed to do that. And we have inspections, but they don't work too no, very well, but well, we, well. Tr we try our best. That's what I told you before, that many authors get more money from these licenses than from selling their books. But we don't have fair use in our legislation as you have in the United States. Well, in Canada we've got that too, but the legislation is coming under review right now. Yes, you had a, a big problem because you allowed, uh, Canada allowed for education, an exception for education. That's right. Which means that uh, the universities stop paying the licenses they have. Well, they're theoretically they're allowed to, to copy up to 10% without paying anything. They are copying everything. The problem in Canada is that some publishing houses closed, That's local, right. and Macmillan, for example, left the country. And now the teachers are asking for a new legislation because if not, they have to import books because they are not producing books for, for education. You know, it's the best example I have. I use this argument whenever I have to speak about licensing, because about piracy, about all those subjects that I speak usually, 
because really it's like I ask for this, give me, give me, give me, and then I have to get back because you gave me so much that now I don't have anywhere where to copy. I don't understand. Um, the president of the International Publishers Association went to the Congress and spoke at the Congress last year. Which Congress? The, the Congress on whether you make the laws to the yeah. parliamentary committee. Yeah. We take it very seriously. Yeah, yeah. I, I've just interviewed someone on the other side of the argument, so I'll send you that interview. It's Here be, in Argentina? No, in uh, Canada. Ah. He's uh, representing the University Teachers yes. Association, and yes. they're arguing against bringing... Uh, uh, changing the law. They're arguing, yeah, don't change it, don't... Uh, don't go back. Don't go back. That's right. So you, you might be interested in his arguments. Yes, certainly, certainly. Okay. But right now, it sounds like you've, from the perspective of a publisher, you're, you're relatively happy with the copyright situation in Argentina. I'm more or less happy, yes. Yeah, okay. um, the law in Argentina is from 1933. Mm -hmm. It has, has lots of reforms, yeah. but it doesn't cover all the problems we have, especially the digital we were, would need a, a, a new law, but the law, it's very good in matters um, for the authors. It's really very, very good. It's a good law. The, the rights of the authors are very well respected. Yeah. We have uh, moral rights, which is very important, mm -hmm. which means that even when the book goes, it's in the public domain, the text has to be respected. Yeah. Well, and yes, the relation between authors and publishers, as long as the authors know what the law is and the publishers know what the law is, it's very easy. Okay. But many people don't know what the law is about. In Argentina, we have another thing that it's um, uncommon out of the Argentina. That's the, pu the public domain. Uh, you have to pay for the public domain. Oh, even after 50 or 70 years? After 70 years, that's the time here, the books get into, into the public domain. And then there is a, play, a thing called Fondo Nacional de las Artes. It's uh, National Arts uh, Fondo, it means... Foundation? Or? For, well, foundation, it's where they get the money. They get money, no? Okay. So with this money, they are very generous and they help the authors or they help the artists or they Well, it would be the ancestors of the authors, typically. Mm -hmm. if it, they, it would be the descendants of no, the authors. But no, 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 no. They help the, the actual authors. But the money they get, it's from the publishers. Before publishing the, uh, before going, uh, selling the book, you have to pay a right for the book you printed that is in the public domain. So 70% years yep. passed right. and uh, I want to for example all those books that are classics yeah Dr. Rappel Jekyll said, and Mr. Hyde, they yeah. pay they have oh. to you have to pay to the to the this uh, public domain office you have to I have to pay as a, as a publisher it's a I have small to pay amount though three percent of, of. The, of the whole edition for example if sales? I sales price to the public you pay that before you've made any sales and what do they do with that money? They help new authors, new, new artists. Authors. Okay, so it doesn't go back. It doesn't go to the descendants of. It doesn't go Robert to the Louis descendants Stevenson. because the descendants already got the money for seventy years. years that's right. It goes to new to promote the arts. I see. That's good. Okay. But the thing is that in this uh, Fondo Nacional de las Artes, there is no representative of the publishers. The representative of the publishers is an author, a translator, and I don't feel that I'm represented. So no. they, I don't and you, you should be because you're paying the money. Naturally, and they don't help the publishers. As publishers, usually what they help is the authors. Yeah. And I think that's very unfair. Good, we got that on the record. <laughs> I don't want to forget. Well, the the fact it, it was it's so horrible for me that when we did the Congress of the International Publishers Association in the year two thousand in Argentina, one of the conclusions was that the public domain should be free, because it's not free in Argentina, Argentina, I think that Bolivia, and Senegal. That's it in the world. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Well, it should be free because you want the free expression of. 
of ideas they exchange no, if you can. And, and the people have already paid exactly. the rights during 70 exactly. years to the author yeah. and its yeah. descendants. Yeah. It's and just like another tax. Naturally, you, and you. the idea of, of having the public domain is that from then on the books of those authors could be it must be cheaper mm -hmm. and they have to go around the world for everybody to know them yeah i guess the if yeah. after 70 years they're still interesting why you have to tax them well on the flip side it means that they've got money that they can use to develop the next generation of writers so that's not so bad after all Blah, blah, you blah, just blah, have blah. to pay for it, though. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. okay, speaking of free expression of ideas, what's the censorship situation like in Argentina? No, in Argentina we don't have censorship So you today. can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want, well, except uh, Nazi. You cannot do, uh, do books, uh, reproduce books, or promote Hitler's ideas. Ah, okay. Those, so eight crimes. Yes, I don't remember the name of Hitler's book. Mein Kampf? Yeah, it's forbidden. His own book is forbidden? Hitler's book is forbidden. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's not the only country where it is forbidden. No. Why is that? Because there's all the, the like, the, the Nazis it, coming many, here? Many, many years ago they, they forbid it and it, it has lasted in there. But they, they sell it in pirated editions. But um, I belong to the Freedom to Publish Committee in the International Publishers Association. Okay. And during the Kirchner government... When was that? Um, in the year 2009, 2008, I think, we gave the Freedom to Publish prize here in Argentina at the book fair. Macri was mayor of the city and he gave the prize to a person from Vietnam. And uh, what prize is it again? It's a pr it's the Freedom to Publish prize. Now it's called the Prix Voltaire. Oh, yes. But before it was only Freedom to Publish prize. I established it in the IPA. And what does it celebrate? Uh, no, it doesn't celebrate. It gives uh, some money to someone that's been persecuted, that okay. has suffered, that didn't have freedom to publish. So ah, we okay. gave it to a publisher in Iran, then we gave it to someone in China, we gave it to... One Anywhere where there's a repressive regime. Usually, it, yes, usually yeah. it comes with a repressive regime, but we gave it, for example, to um, a journalist in Zimbabwe, we gave it also to um, an author in South Africa. No, it's a very interesting thing. Mm. So, in the, in the year 2008, I asked I, the International Publishers Association, I, uh, after I was president, one year after, to give it here because we were suffering some problems with freedom to publish. The persecution was not an open persecution, but maybe if they didn't like something, they would send you the tax office the tax office will come, imagine if it would have been here, they will spend here like three months looking at every paper, everything you've done, then you couldn't, well, it was terrible, really. It was a persecution. It was without sound. It was silent persecution, but there was a persecution. And also to the journalists, it was worst. So just to put the subject in the newspapers, I gave the prize here to someone from Vietnam. And with the, when this WeChat and when this boy arrived to Vietnam, they took everything from him. The good thing is that we had sent the money before, it's 5,000 Swiss francs at that time, now they give 10,000. We have sent him the money by a transference like two months before we gave the prize here. So the prize was just the, the show and uh, it was a, a piece of something with uh, lots of letters and we gave him money to buy a suit and, and shoes and some pocket money for him to go back. You know? And all that was taken from him and he went to jail. Just not such a good thing to win the prize then? No, it wasn't a good thing to win the prize but with that money he published a lot of things against the government and the good thing is that it was something that made Argentinian publishers and readers to pay attention 
that there was that there exist problems with freedom to publish, but uh, not now. What about the dirty war between 1976 and 83? What was that like? Oh. Well, at that time I already had, uh, the, uh, in 1979 I think it was, I bought Claridad. And uh, Claridad, as I told you, was a um, publishing house from the left. Well, not from the left, they were socialists. But we had published Hegel, Marx, all those things. So there was someone from the police that would come once a month and will count the books to see if I had sold any of the books about Marx, Hegel, and things like that, that were forbidden. Oh, so he, he saw the, what your inventory was, and he monitored your inventory. Once a month, yes. Because if he found that you'd sold something, well, he would have what? Take me to jail. For example, there, there was a publisher here in Argentina, Ediciones de la Flor. They published comics, most of it are comics, they published Mafalda, you know Mafalda? Mm -hmm. They published Mafalda. And they had published a book about a horse for children. And the government considered that was uh, something that was... Seditious. Yes, yeah, seditious. That was a seditious book. And a children's book, but seditious book according to them. So they put them in jail. And... Um, this person was a very good friend of the director of the Frankfurt Book Fair. So immediately the mother-in-law, because it was him and his wife, both of them went to jail. The mother-in-law called Peter Weithas from the Frankfurt Book Fair and Peter Weithas started writing and doing notes and asking the Argentine government through the German embassy to put them free. And as they realized that this was a publisher and that the movement would be international, they put him free and told him, told him they had, he had to leave the country in 48 hours. So they left the country and they, they went to live to Venezuela for a long time. The mother of, uh, of the wife, the, the mother-in-law, was the one that stayed in charge of the publishing house here while they were in Venezuela. There are not many cases of publishers, but for example, the, the army also burned the books of one of the publishers here in Argentina. That was terrible. What kind of books were they? Well, they were also socialist books. I see. Yes, but not leftist, only socialist. Right. I mean, they were not extremist. How many people disappeared? Was it 30,000? They say 30,000, but it's discussed. But 30,000 is the official number. Killed or murdered? Killed, murdered, or disappeared, because sometimes they disappeared only. Some went to Spain and changed the name and all that. But right. They disappeared. That it was, have, a, bad, it was a bad time. I remember going to, taking my children to school and uh, we were in the car and beside us was a car and the men were with guns, ametralladoras, you know, not a little gun, no? And my, my first husband worked in a French company and we have to have uh, people that, so I wasn't... I never went alone anywhere. There was another car following me everywhere I went. Like bodyguards? Yes, yes. In the building where I live, which was a nice building, but nothing, not a building of rich people or anything, there were like 10, 12 bodyguards. When you went downstairs in the morning, early in the morning, before leaving for your office, there were the bodyguards taking bath there, waiting for the people to leave. It was horrible. The government would could take you, and that was because you were from the left, or you could be taken by people, sequestrados, abducted, sir? kidnapping. You could disappear because the army could take you, or you could be kidnapped by the montoneros because they needed money. Oh, so they did so for if a you ransom. worked in an international company, yeah, then you could be kidnapped by them. Well, and at the end of the, of the revolution, on the last days of the revolution, my husband, that was working for Dreyfus, and they were doing plywood, 
the, uh, he had uh, imported machines to do a new uh, part of the factory, uh, new, no, a new chain of uh, to to produce plywood, and um, the people that worked with him kept him kidnapped in the business here, there in the factory, until he finished with the German people that had come to put the machines working until they started working. And once they started working, they wanted to take the factory by the employees and they needed my husband because they didn't know how to make how to work, make the, the, the machines work and all that. So they kept telling me that he stayed like one week in the factory. Nothing's going to happen to your husband because we need him. Yeah. But it was a horrible time. It was a horrible time, and then there was this uh, revolution. All, all, it was horrible. First, it was uh, Isabel, and during Isabel, there were already they were kidnapping people to get money from them. Yeah. And then the the army came, and it was horrible too. It was horrible all around. Yes, yes, all the time it was horrible. Well, thankfully, that's in the past. Yes. But I suppose there's always, is there a threat for that type of thing happening again? No. No? no I don't think so. Okay. There, are, there are always movements. Yeah. But yeah. there are always movements everywhere. Okay, just finally, uh, on a bit more a happy note. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big book collector. I love, and I love fine press books. Are there any particular publishing houses or fine press proprietors in Argentina that have produced particularly beautiful books that you're aware of? Uh, yes, I have to think about it, but there is, um, there, there is um, a publisher that produces uh, beautiful books, that he produces books for the museums, and they are really beautiful, but I don't remember the name. Okay. Um, no, it's okay. And is there, a, but is there anything else that stands out from the, the past thirty, twenty, fifty years ago? That well, for example, MSC, which was bought by Planeta, the owner Bonifacio del Carril was the owner. He used to do books where he. For example, the history of painting in Argentina. And those books were very valuable because of the images, because of the, the paintings he would reproduce. Some of them, they were his own. <coughs> and uh, that book was very, very valuable. And that book wasn't done with his own money. He had help from what I call the Fondo Nacional de las Artes, ah, okay. from the money from the public domain. Mm -hmm. And really, those, those kind of books were impossible to be done if there was no help from the government. I see. But uh, I don't think there are editions of that book. Maybe Casares has, but... But they're not around. Yeah. They're not yeah. around. Yeah. No. Yeah. They've yeah. never been around. They were always for collectors. Yeah. There's one individual, I don't recall his first name, his last name is Colombo. He was a master printer. And apparently he printed the, the first, I don't know how many copies of the Soar magazine. He actually, I think he typeset it and printed it. Does that ring a bell for no, you? No, no, not okay. at all. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, um, is there anything else you want to add? Well, we didn't spoke about the situation of the industry in Argentina. Sure. And um, in Argentina, we are having a very difficult time now because there is recession plus inflation. Yeah. So the price of the books has changed. The price of the book changes because every like two months we have the the paper changes the price because the paper has a price that's founded on the price of the dollar. So, so the if, paper, if, the, if the, the dollar goes up, the paper goes the, up. The cost of paper to print the books. Yeah. yeah. And also, you have the problem that when the local uh, economy changes, for example, salaries, here the salaries are, you don't decide 
how much you are going to increase the salaries, but the government tells you how much you have to increase the salaries. So, uh, for example, last year we had to increase 35% plus, we have to give some money that was not considered a plus, but it was given but only for one time. But all in all, what I have to increase was 40% the salaries. So. That's what the government was inflicting that on you. Yeah. Wow. So it's not easy to work here in Argentina. So we are a little bit astonished that the number of titles that have been published during 2018 was only 1,000 less than on in 2017. How many? Uh, 27,428 books, new books, new titles. But the thing is that in the year 2016, we printed 62 million copies. 28,000 books, 62 million copies. In 2017, 28,000 new books, 51 million copies. So we go down with the number of copies. And last year, 2018, only 43 million copies. So from 2016 to 2018, there are 20 less million, million less books. Less books printed. printed. What about sold? Oh, sell, sales are also lower. They've for gone example, down by about the same amount. For amount. example, this three months, this three months, I sold 10% less than the first three months of 2018. Okay. So we are selling around 15% less every year since 2015. So. 2015 is uh, 100, then 16, 15% less, 17, 15% per le uh, less than 16, and like that. Right, so the, the, what explains all of this? The number of books we do, it's less because you don't print 5,000. Because you, you can't sell them. <coughs> you print 1,000, 1,500. Because you can't sell them. Because you cannot sell them or you are going to take too long to sell them. And when the book goes to the bookshop, the book is completely paid except the, the rights of the author. Although some authors ask for an advancement. Yeah. Or in the case of the books I buy outside, all the rights I pay in advance. Yeah, okay. So the, the explanation is that naturally you have inflation, you have recession and people think that the book or consider the book as something that's luxurious. No? Yeah. It's not a need, it's part of the entertainment and but what they explains have other, other ways of reading, no? They can uh, go to the library yeah. and get the yeah. books, also they download it, pirate it from, from the web. There are many people that read from the Gutenberg library, many people that read in the in the computer, mm -hmm. I can't read, I don't like to read in the computer, mm -hmm. or when I do need to do it, I do it, but if not, I I prefer to do, to read in the iPad, no, at least. And so tell me again, why, why is the Argentinian economy, why is inflation so high? <sighs> I wish I knew. <laughs> Uh, in Argentina, a woman that never worked in her life and she arrived to the age of 60 years old without working, uh, it's considered that she has worked at her house mm -hmm. and then she can retire yeah. and she gets exactly the same money as I got when I retired. What I get when I retired, I'm retired, I work. Because Doesn't sound I'm, like it. I'm 73. Mm. <laughs> I'm retired <laughs> because... But you're not retired though. Yes, I'm not retired. But the thing is that if I didn't retire, I would be paying to the government because I'm not retired. So you, you have to pay, pay a back. lot. Yes, yeah. pay back to the government a lot of money. And so I retired. And what I get from being retired and I've been working since I was, since I was 16 is exactly $250. A month. So tell me what you can do with two hundred and fifty dollars a month. Nothing. Mm. But as there are so many people retired, 
It's terrible. Yeah. So here in Argentina, there it's like eight million people working for the rest of the country. Between the people that are retired, the people that have no work and have us are subsidized by the government. Mm -hmm. Uh, the money you give to the children, even if the parents work, the, the children get like uh, some amount of money. Right. Then the education is free. Up till when? Up till the university. Up until the university. Then you the pay. university yeah. is free. Oh, it is? Yes, sir. Education in Argentina is free from kindergarten to the when you finish the university. There are private universities where you pay a lot of money, but you can do everything for free. You know, it sounds like you've just got a really shrinking tax base. That's your problem. Well, the, the tax base... Aging population. This is one of the countries where you pay more taxes. Yeah. In yeah. fact, some people that are able to get the green card in the United States, they transfer everything to the United States where they pay less taxes than here. Yeah. So. My former husband did that. So <laughs> not being, we have a daughter living there. He's not being patriotic. He's Yugoslavian from okay. Cro Croatia. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> no, yes, he's not being patriotic, but he's yeah. Croatian. I see. No, no, but my daughter lives in, in California. She's okay. moving now to New York. but okay. So she got the, the green card for her, her father. <laughs> No, it's mm. difficult. It's very difficult, everything. Mm. So, that's it. The government pays, has too many expenses and they cannot charge more taxes because there is nowhere to get them. Yeah. One of the problems we have at the moment is the electricity and the gas. They told you that. The problem was that during Christina's government, it was nearly free. You were paying peanuts for everything, for the gas and for the electricity. When this government came, they say, no, you have to pay the real value of the things. And the real value of the things is, well, 100% more this month, 100% more three months afterwards, 100%. And there is a moment when even me, I cannot pay. I can't pay it, but really, it's terrible. <laughs> because I pay so much, so much, so much of electricity and so much of gas. Gas is horrible how much you pay. I pay like 10,000 pesos in my house, which last year it was like $500 a month mm. for gas. Too much money. And everything, the taxes on the properties went up, everything went up, 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 up. And naturally, if the electricity goes up and the gas goes up, the prices goes up. The, also, the um, in Argentina, Menem came and destroyed the the trains. Who? Menem. It was uh, President Menem. He was before, before, before. It was Menem, De La Rua, Dualde, which was a transitional, Kirchner husband and Kirchner wife, and then Macri. So Menem stayed like seven years or something like that, and he was very demagogic. Peronista too, but very demagogic, and he privatized everything, and he privatized the electricity, the gas, everything was privatized, and the people were very happy, blah, 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 and he destroyed the, the trains, and the, so all the transportation is done by trucks, and that's very expensive. And lousy for the environment. Yeah, that's horrible. So this government is trying to replace the trains. It goes slowly, but they are doing it. New trains, with new trains. New trains, and, and they have to, to repair all the trucks. trucks. Yes. But those things don't show. Or for example, I have a house uh, from here, it's like one hour from here. In a, it's a beautiful place, blah, blah. And... Uh, I don't have water, and I don't have uh, where you throw the water. You got a well? No, I have a mot I have electricity, so I have a motor and a, 
and I get the water from below the earth. Mm -hmm. And I have a place where everything that's dirty goes. Okay, we're getting a little bit off the uh, track, the publishing track. I know, but you asked me about the... Argentina, I did. You, you can take out that. But no, no, I don't have to. No, that's interesting. By the way, you asked me about <laughs> the situation. <laughs> I did. Uh, and I went... <laughs> yeah. No, but it's, it, it makes, you know... Because... It puts everything in perspective. Naturally. It's obviously naturally. not easy to no. be in, in any kind of business, but publishing... Is publishing more difficult than... It's more difficult thing? than other businesses because, you know, the bookstores don't pay yeah. on time. Yeah. So they declare the books when they want and you have already paid. So with an inflation of 30%, 40% a year, that's terrible. And they get to send back anything they didn't sell anyway. Yes, but at yeah. least those are books and you keep them. Right. And they don't, don't lose value. But your money does lose value. So the, the moment that they say, I sold this book and you have a bill of $100, today it's $100. But when they pay me in three months, that may be $90, $70, $80, whatever. You don't know how much money you're going to receive in, in money that computes as money. Okay. Nothing positive then, except mm -hmm. except you're cultivating a new generation of really great people. <laughs> I think I'm doing something good. Yes, that's right. That's what keeps you going. Yeah, yeah I like it, and it's difficult to stop. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I say, "Well, I'm going to stop," and who's going to buy a publishing company today? They bought the publishing companies at the end of the '90s, before the, the year 2000. But in 2001, we have that big crisis, and from then on, everything went wrong. Uh, during the Kirchner government, we have good times, but they were lies. Hmm. I'm going to show you the book I told you that goes around, that you turn the page. Oh, sure. Well, I'll take a photograph of all those beautiful books, too. That's great. You see? Oh, yeah. So it's a, a tale without words. Yeah. But then the, the parents can read it here. Yes, yeah. And then the teacher turns it and she can tell the tale and read it here. That's terrific, yeah. We, we once published a book without words, which I loved. It was beautiful. I loved that book. But the parents were so afraid of buying it that I ended by giving, making a gift, you know, if you bought uh, three book titles of my company, you could get this for free. Okay. Yes. And um, let's hmm? see, I don't have dictionaries here. So what you're doing again is you're encouraging parents to spend time with their kids here. This is a way for them to do that in a fun, a fun educational environment. Yes, certainly. But for example, my dictionaries, this is uh, Portuguese, Spanish, two volumes. They are big like that. So these are legal dictionaries? Yes, those are legal dictionaries. This is, for example, a book about populismo. We are now working with one university, so we do some books together. What's uh, El Populismo? What's that? Populis. Populism. Populism, oh, uh, like Trump, for example. Yeah, or, certainly, that's it. <laughs> I see, yeah, that's, that's a very popular <laughs> subject. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. And those are, these are the books I told you. <laughs> you see? Oh, yes, Robin Hood. Uh, but even on Robin Hood... But because see, it's in the public it, domain, did you have to pay your three yes, percent? Yes. Because no one not even but knows you who see, wrote that. It has like drawings oh, mixed yeah. with. Um, I have one that's beautiful. This one, Paul. You know what this reminds me is? It reminds me of those Czechoslovakian uh, illustrators. Those. That, uh, that book I. 
It's not illustrated by an, in Argentina. This one is done in Argentina. But this is this reminds me of. You, have you heard of? Uh, his name is Grund. Grund, it's Grund. yes, yes. This this is uh, the kind quite of similar. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. This is the. Beautiful. Um, this is illustrated by an Argentine. You see. Ah yes. Is this typical? No. 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 Yeah, that's really something. What a great book that is. Let me take a photograph of that. Or this one's nice too. Dracula. Dracula. There it's a little bit scary, isn't it? Oh, Which well, is good. It's Dracula. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is um, a publisher here in Argentina called El, El Zorro Rojo. They are in Spain and in Argentina. Okay. They do books also that sound like children books but are really for adults with beautiful illustrations beautiful beautiful illustrations i love it well you know the young adult uh, market i mean you look at harry potter i mean just as many adults read that as oh, kids me? did <laughs> yeah, I mean, well i read it only only because my daughters were uh, you know i read it to them aloud but still i know a lot of adults got into it no, we were discussing with my daughter. I would bring the the volume five just to say something, no. And then she was reading slowly because when I finished, she would say, "Oh, look, I'm still reading, and you already you have nothing to read. <laughs> like I'm still enjoying." Mm -hmm. That was the the thing, and it was funny, no, the competition with mother <laughs> and daughter who yeah. enjoyed more time. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah. She's quite a storyteller. But look, I have nine grandchildren. Four read and five don't read. They, they One do, they reads can, they this do kind the, of books that he likes. They do video games instead? Yes, TV or, yeah. or they, three of them like a lot of uh, sports. Okay, that's a good. So they play They're football, they play hockey, they play rugby, they play whatever. I see. But the girls, the girls play, and the boy, they play soccer, the three of them, and then the girls play hockey, and he plays rugby. They love sports. Hmm. And TV, and, and losing their time. But once for the children's day, I gave each of my grandchildren a book, not of my company. I went and I looked for something special, and the eldest said to me, you don't love me anymore that you bought a book for me. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> and on the other hand, I have um, the ones that live in the United States that are sick. They are sick readers, you know. They go to the library. They are members of the library in their house, in the grandparents' house. My, my, the, the grandfather has a house in Florida. They are members there. I have a house in Florida in another place. They are members of my library because everywhere they go, they go looking for books. Yeah. And as you know, my daughter gets the, the cheapest ticket, so no luggage, <laughs> no books. Yeah. So yeah. they have to go to the library and look for new books. And they are always reading, always reading. Yeah, I guess it's just uh, you're either inclined that way or you're not. Yes, maybe. Uh, yes, because... I read to, to all of them. The same, yeah, you did the, the same. same way. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. When they were smaller, they paid attention, but then they stopped paying attention to my books. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very oh, much. Thanks to you. It was very nice. Yes. Uh, so again, thank you very much for uh, the overview and uh, letting uh, us know about your country and. Uh, and the publishing sector within it. Well, I've been speaking with uh, Anna Marie Cabanella. Cabanellas? Hmm? Cabanellas? Cabanellas? Yes. It's not Italian. C A B A N E L L A S. Cabanellas. Yes, because it's Spanish, yeah. not Italian. Uh, who is, uh, pre is president of editorial Claridad? based in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Thanks again. Well, thank you very much. It was very nice. A pleasure for me to speak with you. Me too. I hope it's useful. <laughs>